Camille has written the very best essays ever on Edmund Spencer, ah. Alice in Wonderland, <laughs> and the Marquis de Sade. She understands Bob Dylan and Susan Sontag. Yes. And she has pursued a career of great integrity. That's my introduction for Camille. Oh. So I'd like to start with a question from a reader. I'll All right. ask readers for questions. Sure. How do you feel about the fact that Silicon Valley dominates our economy and culture? Is there any tech guru you're interested in? Well, no, I mean, no I mean, my last big tech guru was probably Marshall McLuhan. I was like, well, he had a prophetic insight into what was about to happen. He's a kind of my, the patron saint of my, my, my working on the web, you know, with the, from the very first issue of Salon in 1995, when, um, when it's hard to believe that the web still wasn't taken seriously by, um, by serious, you know, by already established journalists. There was a, a major political reporter at the Boston Globe, for example, who um, tried to pressure me not to write for the web. He said, oh, no one takes the web seriously. So, and an enormous thing has happened, which of course has also sucked in a whole generation of young people, alas, that's all they know. I mean, so I, I think we're, in, we're, we're kind of in the, on the downside of that right now. But take, take your last book, yeah. Glittering Images, and your other work, which emphasized the role of the iconic and Western and Eastern culture, the role of the spectacular, vivid, visual, life-giving, spectacular events. And now here we have people, they look, they listen on very small smartphones. Yeah. Is this culture dead? But if the culture was so splendid, why did people give it up so quickly? Well, I, the reason I wrote Glittering Images is because um, I, I felt <coughs> that there's a, uh, an avalanche of, of, of uh, fragmented visual impressions that disconnected, glaring, uh, tacky, you know, badly designed, uh, that, that young people are, are growing up in. I think, the, you know, I think it really is true that the children's brains are being reshaped uh, and that the in the standard um, forms for logic and for um, sequential information and for reasoning are, you know, really it's, everything's kind of disappearing. So I tried to, to write a book where people would just like sort of stare at an image for, for a certain length of time. I think it's getting worse and worse. Like web design, which my, my school, the University of the Arts, uh, teaches and so on. I think web design is in, is in the pits. I thought web design was moving into, you know, was becoming a major genre of the arts. Um, uh, but I, I, mean, I think we're in a kind of swirling vortex. And yes, what you, what you mentioned about, about, the, of this, about the miniaturization of image, it's terrible. I was raised in a time, 19 1950s, when Hollywood was competing with television by, by doing something which television couldn't do, those are the gigantic screens, you know, like the Ten Commandments, there'll be, like, there'll be you know, like, there's like a giant thing of Pharaoh, giant sculpture, you know, starts <laughs> at one end of the screen and you watch it, like go to the other end of the screen, it's phenomenal. Lawrence of Arabia, oh my God, the dunes of Lawrence of Arabia with that music and so on. And so there's no sense of the large. The young, young people have no sense whatever of the expansive, of the big gesture. But did we maybe overrate the large? If the large gave through so quickly, so readily to what you're describing as this kind of mediocrity, what was wrong with that culture of the 50s, 60s, and 70s to begin with? I would say that a culture always moves in <coughs> cycles. Okay, so you so you have you have periods that um, esteem the colossal. Okay, you know, like like, uh, like the Bernini Renaissance, and then you know, and the, and the, and Baroque periods, and then you get. Um, you get the small, the art of the small, like the Rococo is a kind of um, you know, evanescence and an evaporation of the big Baroque squir you know, swirls, and all of a sudden it's like it's like little tiny things, like on a Valentine's card. So, so I think we go, you know, back and forth. I, I just feel lucky. I think that um, you know I have an, a kind of epic. You know, imagination because I was I was raised watching the Ten Commandments. You know, and 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 Ben Hur. Oh my God, Ben Hur! I, I could I could watch that uh, you know, three hundred times. One of your ten favorite yes. movies, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the one on the list that surprised me. Just read it. <laughs> but, but given <laughs> what you're saying, and the music, and the and the music composed for those things, it directly inspired my writing of sexual personae. Absolutely, I'm directly inspired by music. But um, I think for for women, it's, it's it's good to have something that's going to make you like assert, you know, and 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 trample, you know, and and, <laughs> and conquer. <laughs> that animates me. This, these, these are my, uh, you know, these are my maxims. Given what you're saying, do you today consider yourself a cultural conservative? No, not at all. Why not? Um, no, because uh, everything it, used to be better. <laughs> Isn't that all? <laughs> 
No, I, 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 we're in a period of decadence, of falling off, you see. Like, so no, conservative would mean that, that I'm, I'm I would be cleaving to something past, okay, which, which, you know, which, was, which was great um, and, and, and no longer is, and, that, we, and I'm, that, I, that I would be saying we need to return to that. And usually I'm not saying we need to return to anything. I, I, I do believe we're, uh, we're moving inexorably in, into the future. There's a momentum to that. I'm, I'm a libertarian, okay, and I, I don't, so I don't, you know, I, that's why I, I'm, you know, I'm a, uh, I'm always freely offending both sides, you know, liberal, <laughs> liberal conservative, and, I'm a, and I'm a Democrat, even though I'm, I'm constantly criticizing. The, I mean, I think I think a true intellectual um, should be um, always beyond partisanship. Okay, that even if and you always belong, always criticizing. In all, yes, and always <clears throat> critiquing, you know, the the, your, the premises of your own friends and allies. So in the back, we were talking about Brazil. You mentioned you'd been there nine times. Yes, in what, in, you know, nine or ten. Yeah. What does Brazilian culture have which North American culture lacks? <sighs> Well, it, What's it, the draw? It, it's such a polyglot of, um, uh, you know, of, of cultures and eth ethnicities. But beyond that, Brazilians understood my work from the, the first moment I began to publish. Okay? Because what, they, what they understood was artifice, art, okay? because of carnival for them, and, you know, and costuming and masquerade and, and that kind of Baroque exuberance and, and the syncretism of, um, of, of, you know, of Christianity with the Aruba cults of West Africa in Salvador de Bahia. So they understood um, my, my vision of art. Art and, be and beauty, okay, uh, and the and the and your know, beauty is an incredibly important human principle, rather than the way it was being trashed, you know, by, by my fellow feminists at that time. And they also understand nature, the grandeur of nature, the, the power of nature. It's much right? larger. Yes, instead of these like these silly little arguments that um, oh, climate change is causing the end of the world. Oh my God. Okay, anyone who talks like that does not understand the grandeur and the power of nature. And to, oh. to imagine that we can make a change in it is like so uh, absolutely absurd. But what's your theory? of modernity that puts them on one part of the curve and we're on another more decadent part of the curve what, what's the difference? What sort of what we would call the structural equilibrium as economists, if I dare invoke such a thing? Well, Brazil what? is is a, it's, it's in its own world. I mean, it's 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 not it's not been part of world the world wars. You know, it's not it doesn't have this huge militaristic you know, superstructure. It doesn't have a messianic you know, view of itself. Okay, as a, a, a politically, the, the politics are always chaos. <laughs> so in drama, <laughs> it's like in grand opera. opera. <laughs> um, uh, it it it's it, it's it's like another planet. Really, Brazil. Okay, to continue the whirlwind <laughs> tour of Camille Paglia, yeah. you wrote in Glittering Images that George Lucas was perhaps, or maybe definitely, the greatest artist of our time. Mm -hmm. I do not disagree with that. Mm -hmm. But now that you've written that, The Force Awakens have com has come out, <laughs> which you, is not George Lucas. No, that's not George. Who, not, is, who is not the greatest artist It has nothing time. to do with George Lucas. Uh, and and I, I you, haven't seen it. I wouldn't dream of going. Mean, when it's on TV, I'll look at it. Please. <laughs> okay. I'm, oh, I don't, do, do you think I want to sit in the theater and be tortured, okay, by the contamination of my ideals? I'm not going to do that. No, I just, okay. <laughs> and you've spoken very highly of the prequels, which many people don't like at all. Yes. So that, what yes. is it that people don't mm -hmm. get about the prequels? They say Jar Jar Binks yeah. and they... They scream. They oh, I, I can't tell you. Oh, uh, oh, I know. I know exactly but what they're talking about. Tell us what's good about. No, the it, it was Revenge of the Sith that I really. A, after I, you know, the great volcano, volcano planet climax of Revenge of the Sith. I think it's one of the, one of the greatest sequences in all, all of modern art. The, the thing is, once I had written about it, I realized as I went out into the world how few people had actually seen the movie uh, because people had given up on on the pre, on the prequels <coughs> you know, long before. Uh, therefore, I think you know anyone who dismisses what I say about about these, you know, the sublime quality of the you know, the vision. And the execution, and the, and the emotion, and, you know, the passions of that of that scene. Um, really, they, they just you know they don't know what I'm talking about because they, they haven't exposed themselves to it. Music, Rolling Stones. Yes. Here are the two albums, Hot Rocks, more Hot Rocks. Now you wrote about the Rolling Stones some time ago. Yeah. But if I look at the career of the Stones, and they have a new album coming out this year, I find it striking that they've kept on going, and I actually count that as a mark against them. I still think they're good, but when I go back and listen, I never hear new things in their music. So now that some time has passed, mm -hmm. what would you say about the Rolling Stones? And do you agree that you're a little disappointed with them? Well, I haven't been following mm -hmm. them for, for many, many years. You know, to, to me, the, the Rolling Stones uh, were a revolution when they happened, in that period when the, you know, the Beatles were all upbeat, and, happy, and then here come these surly guys sneering and spitting and, and so on and so on. The I Beatles mean, were dark and subtle, too, right? Well, not like, not like the Stones. But here's the difference, is, is that, is that the, the Rolling Stones are, are, are inspired by, animated mm -hmm. by, to this day, by, by, you know, by the... Uh, 
blues, okay, by the blues tradition, and, and the um, the uh, the Beatles really were more almost Broadway and and, and, and musical Who did comedy musical? And, and, and yes, British musical and Tin Pan Alley and, and so on. Um, they were tremendous songsmiths, but there's nothing dark about them. In other words, you're not you're not getting the, uh, Paul McCartney was a, is a you know a wonderful bass player, but you're not getting the big roaring sound, okay, of of you know Bill Wyman's bass at the beginning of uh, you know of uh, at the beginning of the, of the Stones' career. Um, and I I really have not been following the Stones ever since Bill Wyman mm -hmm. left the Stones. I have not I have not fe I have not felt that that's with the Stones I knew. So I'm I'm delighted that they, that they go on and that they perform and so on. But I have absolutely no interest in in um, exposing myself to those uh, horrible arena you know conditions for for music I, it's like it's it's a, a it was, people like you know oh my goodness <laughs> just uh, the light shows and the this and the that and i this is not this is not a you know they're not musical experiences they're social experiences now so what's the music from classic rock that when you listen to it today every single time you hear more in it like i would say brian wilson and jimi hendrix every time i hear mm. them it sounds different and fresher oh for my me God. but what what are your picks well, you know, Jimi Hendrix is one of one of you know the great geniuses of of uh, of, of any instrument in the last hundred years. Uh, obviously, his his music has has lasted, still fresh, and so on. Um, you know, you know for me, uh, you know, there's a whole period there. I, te I teach in my uh, art of song lyrics course. Um, you know, I just w was doing um, you know like Crosby, Stills and Nash, uh, uh, you know, doing Wooden Ships. And it still has this incredible power. I, I, I love that the entire period of the, of the 1960s, the music, I think. Um, it was a, a kind of magic moment. And then still in the 70s, um, Led Zeppelin, you know, when the levee breaks, it still has enormous power. A lot of that music that uh, Jimmy Page was, was doing, a lot of it working in the studio, actually. It wasn't, it wasn't just live music. So fast forward back to the present. Who would be a musical artist today? I, I know you've written Taylor Swift as a pestilence, so it's probably not her. <laughs> Taylor Swift. But who would be is a like musical a artist today who stands up to the giants of the past? S uh, stands up to, uh, to working today? Working oh, today or close to today? The last no, 10 now years. I, I, you know, I, en I was enjoying, I was really very hopeful about Rihanna for a while there. And, uh, but uh, you know, unfortunately, I think that uh, she's not really working with a top. You know, produces any longer, and her, her this, the new album is an, an atrocity, um, and it's really it's, it's really terrible. It's sad because there are so many people with talents, okay, who are not being developed. It's because uh, our, our you know our music industry is now very formulaic. People can't you know young people can't really um, move along, you know, studying their instruments and um, you know getting their chops over a period of time. So and, and um, they, there's nothing to draw on in the way that, uh, that the musicians of my generation could draw on the folk. Tradition, the folk music, and You're sounding um, like yeah. a cultural conservative. Well, it's <laughs> not, it, no. I'm just saying there are certain there are certain moments, um, you know, certain magic moments <laughs> of, cre of of fertility or creativity that happen to, happen to, in many of the <laughs> arts. Okay, you can find certain key moments where there's a confluence of influences and a certain richness. And at that, in that very moment, it's a great time to be alive, to be young. For example, Shakespeare would not be Shakespeare if he were alive today. It, as it happens, he left Stratford for whatever reason. Okay, went to London at a magic moment. Okay, when theater was flourishing, which was only for a few decades, and then it was out again. Okay, and so on. So, it, 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 so there's, there's, it's, there's a certain kind of luck that if, if you're the right person at the right time in, in any one Ka of the artistic Kanye West, genres. every album is different. Oh he draws God, upon a lot of sources Lord. from the past. Oh my God, the bloat, by, the by bloat. Rap. Okay, blo oh, rhythm blo and blues, no? no? What can I say? Okay, okay I understand. <laughs> education, some questions yes. about education. Yes, okay. There's a new model, a school called Minerva, where you take four years, you spend each of the four years in a foreign country, one year in Buenos Aires, mm. one in Istanbul, uh, one in Bangalore, mm. I think. You work in small classes, but the classes are all online. There's no library. There's no formal campus, per se. It's been around for about two years. What do you think? What's your prediction? Well, I think the idea of sending young people abroad is great. I mean, I think that is a proper use of the money that's going down the tubes okay, at the major universities right now. And so for parents to think, you know, it would profit the, the, the you know, young people a lot, you know, to be exposed to the world. Because, uh, because our, uh, right now, our primary school education is, is absolutely appalling, okay, in its lack of, of world history and world geography. Okay, we're, we're producing, I mean, I know because I get, I get the, everyone in my classroom, I'm, I'm lucky 
lucky I teach at a kind of school where um, I'm getting students from a wide range of preparations. Okay, so there might be a couple of private school you know, people, but, but people from the inner city, of, you know, from, from good schools, from bad schools. So I, have, I really have a very clear sense after 40 years of teaching what's going on okay, at the primary school level. And it, it is unbelievable how little they know. It's absolutely shocking how little they know. This is a, a recipe for a disaster. So I say, yes, send them abroad. Fantastic idea. Now, this other thing of the online thing, I don't believe this online thing okay, at all. Okay? <laughs> I, I think that you need, an, you need, you need the live person. Okay? And, you need, and you need a live person who can talk okay, extemporaneously okay, and respond to the moment. Okay? And, and not just people who are like reading the same old damn lecture okay, over and over again. Um, the, you know, the kind of form, then also the kind of formulaic teaching that goes on in the, in the Ivy League. And also the kind of teaching that goes on in the Ivy League where um, there's all fl a flattering. They, they, they're flattering. There's like these small seminar things. Okay? And they, and the they, A minus seminar, and, and, right? And, 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 so, and so there's all this practice in learning how to talk in this slightly pretentious way about things and impressing each other, blah, blah. And so what? You know, so they're all packaging them for the whole bourgeoisie. Send and them to Brazil, oh, right? Like, oh, <laughs> God. Okay. And so, uh, and, and they're so proud of themselves as they produce the, all the all these like, clones, okay, all these polished bourgeois clones, speaking um, of witless, <laughs> knowing nothing. Okay. Speaking of inspiring teachers, what's your favorite Harold Bloom story? That My you can favorite. Tell? You, are, you mean you mean personal story? Personal story. Uh, well, I don't know about favorite, but if you want to know the story, the I, story. Oh, all right. Okay, right, here's the story. <laughs> okay, all right. So I never took a course with Harold Bloom. Okay, I, I, I was in graduate school at Yale, and um, I just never took a course with him. So I didn't know him at all. And then he heard. I, I, the only time I encountered him. Uh oh, this is going. Oh, I, I shouldn't say this. Okay, maybe, but um, but at any rate, I would. <laughs> let's say he would come according. Okay, and so I do. I do like that <laughs> with uh, with, with a, a famous poet who was a friend of his, who also named. Um, and I, because I, I, so I, I would see him turning up at the door way, you know, and I, so I, hello, 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 hello. Okay, that's all. So I, um, I, I just knew him, you know, to say hello to. Him. Um, and so then he heard what I was going to be working on, and I, that I was having trouble. Okay, finding a, a dissertation director for. Um, a, a study of androgyny in literature and art. Okay, and, um, and it's a time when nobody was doing. Uh, it's hard to believe now because everything is sex and gender everywhere. Um, but at the time, no one was doing a dissertation on sex at the Yale Graduate School. I mean, it's hard. It's hard to believe. Okay, um, and, uh, and, and so he summoned me to his office, and uh, and and that's really how we met. And he said, "My dear, I am the only one who can direct that dissertation." And I said. <laughs> Okay. All right. And so, and, all right. <laughs> and so that, and that was it. Okay. So then he he, he understood everything. He said, understood everything um, I wanted to do with, with the book, and he understood my ideas. Um, and so he he was a fantastic resource, you know, for me insofar as he also supported me, you know, or you know, gave me confidence throughout all those decades when I couldn't get it published. And, you know, I couldn't. I, my sexual persona was rejected by seven publishers and five agents. And, I, and, I, if I, if I, and by the time it was published, I was 43 <coughs> years old. Um, so I, I, I'm like a great you know, role model, it seems to me, for people um, to, you know, to, to <laughs> just soldier through adversity and rejection and just continue to, you know, to develop the craft. And eventually, hopefully, uh, you know, one will you know, see one's work in print. And what did he think of you and sexual persona? Well, he, I mean, he like, he, he, of course, he, he was like, you know, he, he always said I gave him great naches, okay? <laughs> All right, which is, you know, one, which is sort of like the, of a father to a, a daughter, et cetera. But he and I agree about Freud. Um, you know, we have a, a kind of a Freudian, you know, psychohistory and, and so on. Now, this is a segment of all of these conversations. In the middle, <clears throat> it's called underrated or overrated. I mention something, and you tell me if you think it's underrated or overrated okay. by our society. Right. And now the first by, one, Oh, by our society or by me? Well, y your opinion relative to the society. Oh, okay. Opinion. Now, don't hold back on these. Tell us what you think. <laughs> <laughs> All right. First one, economics. Economics as a field? As a field. Overrated or underrated? Uh, probably underrated. Why? I don't know. I, I just think that um, e economists sort of are kind of figures of fun sometimes in cartoons. I don't know. I just, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just judging by what I, I, I sense. William Faulkner. Oh, he's totally gone, poor man. Okay, oh, he, I mean, I actually have been commenting on this recently to my to my friends. So do you remember, do you remember that you know, that period when Faulkner was everywhere and everyone read him and it was, he was just like a, a you know just a baseline uh, figure. And then um, you know thanks to um, Kate Millett and all these philistine <coughs> you know, feminist you know, uh, types um, in the early '70s, there was like a great sweeping away of of uh, many many uh, major uh, male figures in the history of literature, including Ernest Hemingway, um, D. H. Lawrence. Okay, who had a huge influence on me. 
Um, so, so I mean, if, if you are you know, a resident of Mississippi, Faulkner still lives and is vivid. But I, I, I think outside of that, it's been years since I've heard Faulkner mentioned. Okay? So you're uh, saying underrated. Well, I, I think he should be in a, on, the, on the reading list. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I, perhaps he was overrated in our, in our time, but he certainly is like it was a major author and major in, you know influence on American literature, for heaven's sakes. But that's a, young young people aren't aren't you know aren't reading him, and, and they aren't reading many of the great uh, authors. Yoko Ono, overrated or? Oh, Yoko Ono. Do you, oh, don't start me on Yoko Ono. <laughs> so one of my least favorite people in the universe. Okay. Oh, I yes, I blame her for the breakup of the Beatles. <laughs> And so on, and all that, all that, doing all that screechy yodeling that went on. Oh, oh my God! Well, she's a horror. Yeah, but, but I gave her her due in glittering images, okay? Because because she was a very important figure in um, in the development of conceptual art. Okay, her, 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 and her, you know, she she really was very innovative in the 1960s. But oh, what a dreary, humorless person. Um, <laughs> Now, when I think of a lot of your books, and especially if I contrast you to Marxist criticism, yes. I think of your emphasis as being a lot of metaphysics in a very exciting, big picture way. So let's say we take a writer, very high quality, but she moves very far from metaphysics. She writes stories about small numbers of people in rural Ontario, Alice Munro. Oh, I don't read fiction. I don't read contemporary fiction. I have absolutely, absolutely zero interest <coughs> in contemporary fiction. There is I, I, the last contemporary fiction I have any interest in is anti mame and I'm not kidding. Okay, uh, I, I like plays like Tennessee Williams. No, the, the fiction writers are off in another world. Okay, they are not. They don't see the world as it exists now. They don't. They don't use the language of the contemporary world. Their their English is utterly stale. Okay, and cloistered. I cannot read a page. Okay, of contemporary fiction. I'm sorry. And about anything that is pre contemporary. Fiction, I'm, I, I'm a great admirer of. So if I, I, have, I haven't read, and believe me, I have not. I, I, these are the kind of books I like. I, I'll open like this, like that. You're going to pass on no. Harry Potter no. too. <laughs> Harry Potter, no, I don't. I, don't, I, don't. I mean, it, yeah. I mean, I, in fact, I refused to write on Harry, Harry Potter for the Wall Street Journal once, and they said, "Oh, who should we ask next?" And they asked Harold Bloom, and so now, so Harold Bloom became known for. So he got that because of me. Just like, just like Norman, Ma just like Norman Mailer got to interview Madonna for the cover of Esquire, okay? Because Madonna said no to me, okay? All right, that's another. All right, people kept trying to bring us together. HBO wanted to do a my dinner at Andre type thing with Madonna and me. You know, she just like. Just like a fray. I mean, I, I don't know why. I think she thought I was like, going to be like some big intellectual, but it's not true. Parenthood, overrated or underrated? Who? Parenthood. Parenthood. Oh no, oh, no, I don't, I don't no. have anything to do with that. No. Okay. <laughs> the most underrated. I don't watch. I don't want you. Yeah, yeah. No, Go not ahead. the show. Parenthood. Oh, the oh. thing. Parenthood. Oh, Parenthood. Are you being a parent? Oh, oh, well, yeah, that was a big switch. <laughs> 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 That's what Good these Lord. are. Good Lord. I mean, I'm like, we, we need a warning sign for a U, you know, U-turn. Okay, all right, go ahead. Yeah. Parenthood, overrated or underrated? Uh, by, uh, parenthood. Uh, well, okay, I mean, obviously we're in a, we're in a time now where, um, you know, parenting is, is in crisis, I would, I would think. I mean, I think that it is a, it's a, I mean, the reason we have all these whiny, you know, super, uh, super sensitive girls on campus who run shrieking, okay, the, you know, that the slightest thing that offends their ears or drag mattresses, you know, onto, onto the stage at commencement exercises. Uh, the reason we have that is because the parents have not prepared them, okay, for real life, okay. So, um, you know, in other words, they've been, they've been raised in this, this bourgeois, you know, pampered cocoon. Uh, so I think there's been a, a tremendous um, a failure of, of parenting, so, certainly, okay, in terms of young people being ready to take on the, the real world in their late teens. What's the most underrated play by William Shakespeare? The most underrated play? Yes. I don't know. I mean, I, I really can't answer that. I'm teaching, I'm teaching my Shakespeare course this, um, this semester. I, I, I simply focus on the, the really major plays, so I don't, I don't, there's no, so I don't know, I mean, perhaps Antony and Cleopatra is, is like, is starting to recede. I don't know why. I think Antony and <coughs> Cleopatra was a great favorite of my generation, of, um, of, uh, you know, of the 60s generation. But for some reason, it's becoming, I think, um, marginal. I'm not sure. Maybe it's because it's about imperialism. May I ask a few questions about sex? Oh, of course. You've covered this topic before. The audience will, will, will demand it. Yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> Which country comes closest to your vision of having healthy relations 
between the sexes or among the sexes is maybe a better way to put it. Well, I would say that you know that Brazil has the has the healthiest view of sexuality, but I I wouldn't say that the sexes are particularly getting along in in the um, upper middle class in in Brazil as, as I meet professional <laughs> women journalists and so on there. I mean, I think that they, I think that the the women are magnificent. They're like they're, they're incredible the way they look and dress and they have such style and and assertiveness and so on. But I, I'm not sure the communications with, with men are particularly um, uh, you know, successful right now. There's a lot of static there. And the men look kind of, um, the men are like gnomes, you know. The, it's strange. You know, they, they don't have this thing. Like in the, in the United States, usually at the upper, upper middle class, you know, successful careers and so on, you'll have the women doing their Pilates, and then the men will be going to the gym also. And, and, but in, and not in Brazil, okay? The men just seem to sag and get plumper and plumper and duller and duller and lose their hair, and nobody minds, okay? I think because they, they, they assume that the that woman rules. It's like a woman is the, you know, the cock of the walk down, down there. It's like, it's, I'm still trying to figure it out. I, I, but anyway, I love it. I adore it. I mean, I love Brazilian women. Okay, they're they're, I was, they're so bossy. Okay, <laughs> we've we've now had gay men in the military for some time. Yeah. out openly, legally, yeah. permissible. Mm -hmm. uh, how that has run? Has it surprised you? Because earlier you wrote you expected it could be quite disruptive, and it hasn't been. Um, in, in a sense, has male gay culture turned out to be tamer than what you expected in the early '90s? Tamer. Tamer. More domestic. More people adopting children. More people settling down. Mm -hmm. Well, it's changed. There's no doubt about it. I mean, I think that you know that the um, <coughs> you know the AIDS was like a holocaust. Okay, and, and, and the, you know, the number of of um, interesting, fascinating, talented men, of artists, and and and, and people who were just you know in, in fashion and just every every level. I mean, I, I think that in, in many ways, gig culture is sort of still recovering from that. We're we're at a kind of like I don't know, kind of holding pattern. I think after the, the there was a great, an enormous kind of flamboyance and um, an assertiveness to gay male culture once, and it had a distinct style uh, and voice of its own. And so, yes. so what you're saying, uh, oh, things are turning out better. Well, yes, there's an assimilation going on, okay, uh, but also to me a kind of disappearance of that gay aesthetic that was. Um, so I mean, Oscar Wilde is one of the you know the, the, the major influences on, on my thinking. Remains that I teach a whole I teach a whole course on Oscar Wilde, and now what can you say? I mean, is there you know is there anything distinctly um, gay right now? Except the, you know there are certainly gay activists um, are extremely successful. Okay, in terms of, of pushing their agenda and and um, and, and you know, and, and so I mean, that's about probably these little cadres of gay activists are the only thing that's left. I don't know. I mean, I, I, I you know, I, I mean, I, I think it's, it's assimila the assimilation is always a, a loss. I mean, certainly my culture experienced it. Italian American culture is like kind of vanished too. For America, what should an ideal of masculinity look like now? Uh, what it should, what, what should it look like? Well, I don't know. I mean, the older I think generation, you would have like a, a Cary Grant or a Rock Hudson, right? You would see the movie Philadelphia Story, one of your favorites. There was some ideal of masculinity on the screen, maybe not your ideal, but today, what <clears throat> what is it that's out there which comes closest to your ideal? Well, you know, many of those images on the screen, of the, uh, which would seem to be masculine, often <laughs> the actual actors you know, were, were gay. Okay, you know, like Rock Hudson and, and Cary Grant's sexuality I mean, remains one of the great mysteries, and you know, something a, a, a lot. A lot of things. I mean, I adore Cary Grant. Oh my God! But but it's, but, he, but he's like a hallucination. You know, all, all of the great <laughs> images, you know, of, on the screen are hallucinations. You know, I mean, Kim Novak in Vertigo is literally a hallucination. Um, but um, what should be the? I, the you know, the, pro the problem right now is that is that the, the masculine has no honor, whatever, in our, in our culture. We're in, we're in a period now where um, you know young people are being processed through the universities, um, and uh, the, the you know the gender uh, norms, okay, are, are said to be that that you know gender. Is a is a construct. It's um it's a it is simply the the product of environmental pressures on people. There's we, nothing we, in the body. We have a big culture. I mean, not not everyone goes to university. So thank goodness. 
You can go to a NASCAR race, and a few of the yeah. people there have not been working class to the Ivy Leagues. Working so class, working mm -hmm. class culture retains an idea of the masculine. There's absolutely no, no doubt about that. Okay, there's there's a vital, but but you, you see, with with that comes static. Okay, so you have to have str you have to have strong women in order to deal with masculine men. Okay, and so that's that is why masculinity is constantly being eroded and, and diminished and dissolved. Okay, on university campuses because it allows women to be weak. Okay, and if you if you have weak men, then you can have weak women, and that's what we have. Okay, We're, the, our university system is, um, uh, is not, it, it, the, anything that, that is remotely masculine is identified as toxic, um, as, uh, as uh, intrinsic to rape culture, uh, a, a utopian future is imagined when there, there are no men, we're all like, we're all genderless mannequins, uh, you know, and, and, and to me the, the, the movie of the time machine is like one of, uh, you know, we're moving toward that, the Eloy, and so that's how I see the, um, the upper uh, middle class graduates of, of the Ivy League, they're the Eloy, okay, they're, uh, <laughs> they're, they're com completely bland, they have no ideas. They all get along very well with each other because they're nothing, okay, and so on. And they're and they're eating their fruits, okay, which are given to them by the moral ox, okay, who come or the industrial class, and so on. So that's why how I see the future is that I mean, unfortunately, I mean, I I began my career talking about androgyny and, and and talking about the you know the imaginative complexity of androgyny and how how the artist and the shaman and you know and the, the prophet have this androgynous component. But this today's androgyny, okay, is, is just boring. Okay, this is this you know I mean David. Bowie at his height, okay, it was absolutely brilliant, electrifying, <coughs> kabuki, you gotta go on and on and so on. And now all these p pallid androgynes of today, okay, they have, well, there's nothing creative about them, whatever. But just to try to cheer you up a bit, what then is <laughs> the healthiest segment of American society? Because again, you've lived most the of your life in the Northeast, mostly in colleges and universities, <laughs> yes, correct? Yes, yes. So think outside the box. Where, where do you see vitality both culturally, sexually, in terms of aesthetics? <laughs> um, no, I mean, I don't. I mean, I think there's been a tremendous flattening. I mean, I don't, I, I think there's very little culturally that, you know, that there's, right now, there's very, very, very little of substance or, or interest being produced in, um, in art and, cu and culture, we're in a kind of retro period. We're like we're kind of like chopping up everything, you know, putting everything from the past you know, through the grinder again. Um, How about Canada? Overrated or underrated? Or do they just have all the same problems? Well, ca Canada, you know, they 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 have this um, they have this ideal of the consensus, and that, that's why when I go up there, you know, people 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 have said to me actually, on, you know, like quietly, oh, I love having you here, you know, because everyone's always forcing us to have consensus in Canada. Okay. <laughs> all right, and I and I've, I've been told that also when I go to Norway, people say, oh, we can't stand it. We're not allowed to have an opinion in Norway. We all have to have a consensus. <laughs> Right, so you know, I mean, uh, Canada is a, uh, everyone is very civilized in Canada, okay? But 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 it's in, it's impossible to rise above the herd. Also, okay, you can't make any you know big <laughs> gestures, okay? You're, you're thought to be um, in, uh, antisocial, okay? So I, I wouldn't I wouldn't glorify Canada. Let me ask you a few questions about yourself. Yeah. Uh, there's a, a wonderful four-page essay you wrote called "The Artistic Dynamics of Revival," where you talked about how creators have early, middle, and late periods. Beethoven is maybe the most obvious example, but there are many, many others. Mm -hmm. When you think of your own career, how do you see it as fitting together in terms of like a time arc and what you've done, what you want to do? What are your early, middle, and late periods? Well, Where my, are you in it now? My early period was total failure, flop, and, and you know, an inability to get published. Okay, there was that, and then, <laughs> then all of a sudden, I sort of burst out like a jack in the box, um, and I, it's been like blabber, 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 like ever since, like, <laughs> like that. I mean, I don't, so I don't, I really don't see phases. I just see so like you know, bla <laughs> nothingness, and then everything. Okay, and so on. It's like, <laughs> I mean, sort of like a carnival, you know. You know so and what, you know. what will the late period look like? The late period, okay. Which you, you've, we haven't gotten to it yet. So the everything is the middle period. Well, right now I'm I'm working on something that no one has any interest in. You know, whatever. Okay, I've been working for eight years on this my Native American explorations. Okay, I'm I'm very interested in Native American culture at the at the <coughs> end of the uh, ice age as the as the glacier withdrew. Okay, um, and I go around and I like find little tiny artifacts and I, I read and so on. And absolutely no one, especially anyone in Manhattan, has a, has the slightest <laughs> interest in what I'm doing. All right, but but um, that's, you know, I think that that's, uh, everything has been prepared for 
in my life. I've been always interested in archaeology, and they, I feel I can make a contribution, okay, even though no one is interested at all. What, I, what I'm trying to do is show how um, the politicization, you know, <laughs> of ethnic studies and of uh, and racial studies and so on has actually been very limiting. I mean, I, 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 I find very objectionable this projection, uh, eternal projection of like of genocide and disaster and, and you know and so on onto <laughs> Native American studies. And so I'd like to to show you know the actual vision of, of, of Native American culture, uh, which is re religious vision, metaphysical vision, okay, um, and cyclical uh, approach. Cic cyclical relevance of nature. Yes, oh, oh, totally. At the it, 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 it's, it's almost like a, an early it's like animism. But it, it, that's why I'm interested in Salvador de Bahia also, because the Yoruba cults of a West Africa that were absorbed into Salvador de Bahia in Brazil, um, are, it's the same. Okay, where where the um, all of the forces of nature are, are perceived as as you know spirit entities that that you know bring you energy or vision. Mm -hmm. So of the Native American cultures which have come down to us, which is different, of course, from what you had at the Ice Age. But which of those do you relate to the most, and why? Oh well, I'm, uh, all I'm doing is um, exploring the, the um, Native American cultures of the Northeast because it, it's when, they, when the settlers came from Europe, uh, they, they, the Indians were pushed out. Okay, the, the hunting grounds were um, you know, some, you know, were limited, and then then there was. Um, you know, I mean, the, the, the general destruction of, of, of Native American culture for many reasons during that period. But um, it's, it's out, we, we know more actually about the Plains Indians and obviously Northwestern Indians and the Navajo than we do about the Northeastern Indians. Sure. And, I, and I believe that there are remnants everywhere. I, I suddenly, I mean, I stumbled on this. Um, and I just could, um, I, I'm very sorry I didn't notice this when I was living all those years in upstate New York. Uh, where the Onondagas, you know, still have their reservation and, and, and so on, and the, the, probably the remnants of of, um, of those these um, glacial, you know, era cultures were still there as well. Okay, but um, I find again, every, it's absolutely staggering. It is staggering. Okay. The, the, the actual signs and remnants that are everywhere in the Northeast. I mean, I could go out right now and, uh, into the, you know, to find some dirt, okay, and I'll and, I, and I'll find you a, 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 a tool, okay, a, 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 you know, broken tool. It's, a, it's absolutely incredible. So I, I feel that's what I'm. I, I should be doing something like this, which um, <laughs> which no one is interested in. But I feel that um, you know is um, is substantive and can you know and, and I hope can help to you know, to show what was here before. More about you <clears throat> and Vamps and Tramps, you once wrote that as early as 1981, the second volume of Sexual Persona was <sighs> more, finished is a tricky word, we mm -hmm. know as writers, it was, but some version yeah. is finished. And do you think it we was, will was all ever have the privilege of reading it? Well, the, the, the Yale Press didn't want to publish, publish those I'll last publish chapters. It. No, they, but the, you know, they, 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 it didn't. Need to, they, they, so the Yale Press ended with the end of the, uh, of the 19th century with um, you know Emily Dickinson. It was already a 700-page book, um, and so yes, and so I so I, I put in there the next book was coming. But then, then what happened, of course, is that throughout the 90s and you know since the last 25 years, I've been essentially. You know, writing in articles, okay, everything that I would have written, written mm -hmm. in that thing. So I, everyone, all my writing on popular culture, I, you know, I continue to do. Like on football, my, I had a, I had a chapter of baseball versus football, uh, and, and football is the ultimate pagan, you know, sport, etc. Well, I've, I've been, you know, so I wrote Wall Street Journal, my, you know, my football feminism, and, you know, I have a whole kinds of philosophy of that, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And now, and now football is is getting more and more boring. It's gotten more and more technocratic. Okay, so it's it's not in a period right now that I would celebrate. But I, but I, I was. You know, Celebrating that tremendous period, you know, when there were still hard, hard hits, uh, and uh, and there was still defense, okay, and there wasn't all this like you know throwing, flinging the ball down the field, <laughs> and like people catching it, blah, 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 like ballerinas. Please, that's not football. Football is wham like that. And Bring uh, back the fullback. <laughs> so on, you know, and uh, the, the TV, the TV won't show the great defensive plays, you know, and so on. I mean, they saw the whole art of defense um, and the great offensive, you know, defense and lines, and, and that, that, that kind of uh, tussle. Um, it's it's like that's kind of gone. So I, I, I'm lucky. I feel lucky that I saw, uh, you know, uh, football on TV at its high point. You also wrote that when you were in high school, you either wrote or just started a book on Amelia Earhart. Oh yes. And what was the appeal of her to you? Oh my God. Okay. Well, Amelia Earhart, I, I stumbled on. It was like an article, 1961. Okay, in the um, in the Syracuse Herald Journal about. You know, there's always some article about Amelia Earhart. You know, someone finds a fragment of something and you know something. And I, I became very interested in her. And I, at that point, I was like, four, I guess, 14. Uh, and so I began researching her. And, I, and um, in the bowels of the uh, Syracuse library, the, 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 the things were still not on microfilm yet. It was like the, all the newspaper 
papers were still there from the 1930s. So I did that for like three years in this research project, and that's how I became um, a feminist before feminism had revived, okay, because I, be, I, I suddenly discovered this period uh, just after women had won the right to vote, okay, in the 1920s and 30s, where you had all these career women, like Amelia mm -hmm. Earhart and, and uh, Dorothy Parker, Dorothy Thompson, um, you know, uh, you know uh, Claire Booth Luce, were like just, you know, there's just so many women, uh, Margaret Brooke White, uh, and, uh, it, and so by the time second wave feminism revived, okay, which was with the with uh, Betty Friedan's co-founding of Now in 1967, um, I, I was out of sync with them. Okay, so when they all, when suddenly they, they revived and began complaining about men and blah, 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 all that stuff and so on <laughs> and so forth, and I, I, you know, I, I, I hated it. Okay, and I was all out, and I was a, it, it was cl early clashes that I had with those feminists from the start. I, tr I tried to join second wave feminism, and they wouldn't have me. They kept, they kept them very, because I would not bad mouth men. Because, you see, these women like Amelia Earhart and so on, they did not, they did not bad mouth men okay they admired men they admired what men had done okay and what they said was we demand equal opportunity for women which give us the opportunity to show that we can achieve at the same level as men as, as who did all these great things that was not the tone okay of second wave feminism from the start it was always like man there's a patriarchy blah, 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 yum, 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 like this and so on bunch of I mean these women were insane okay I, I from the from the start okay I like I, I went to this feminist conference okay at, Ye at the Yale Law School okay when I was in grad school, it was 1971, Kate Millett was there, Rita Mae Brown, okay, who later became a lesbian novelist and lives on a horse farm in Virginia, okay, around, you know, so on. Um, maybe she's, she's here. Maybe she's here. <laughs> she's like very rich and so now, okay, at any rate, so, and so Rita Mae Brown said to me, okay, she said, the difference between you and me, Camille, okay, is that you want to save the universities and I want to burn them down, okay, now this is, that, what can you say with, what, 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 when there's a conversation stopper, okay, so I had, I had, I, it, I had the knockdown argument of the Rolling Stones, okay, with the New Haven women. Liberation Rock Band, okay, all right? I adored the Stones, they hated the Stones, okay? So we, we had this huge screaming argument, okay? I, my back was to the wall, they were spitting in my face, okay? And, 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 I, and I, I said, yes, the Rolling Stones are sexist, but they make great music, and they all, no, 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 I said, all right, let's take a, let's take, let's take, under my thumb, under my thumb, yes, it's sexist, but it's a great song, it's a work of art, okay, and so on. And these women, okay, said to me, they said, art, Art, nothing that demeans women can be art. Now that more, is the Stalinist view of art. Okay, right. More about you. More okay, about you. Right, Less right, about that. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> then there was, wait a minute, then, then there was the argument that I had, okay, this is about, this is Amelia Earhart, you asked about Amelia Earhart, yes, okay. yes. I, <laughs> then I had my first job at Bennington College in 1972, okay, and, and then people said, oh, there's, there's this new women's studies department, one of the first ever, I said, uh, State University of New York at Albany, okay, you know, you, you, oh, it'll be wonderful, okay, so, I, okay, so they're feminists, I'm feminist, okay, okay. all right, so, <laughs> so we had like a dinner, okay, we we're going to go to a lecture, okay, and so on, and we didn't get through to dessert, let me tell you, over that, over that dinner, okay, because we had this screaming argument about, about hormones, okay? They deny that hormones have the slightest <laughs> impact on human life. They said hormones don't even exist, okay? They told me I had been brainwashed, okay, by male scientists to believe, and I, so, I'm, and these are women who are in the English department. I had a wonderful education they had in biology. And so on. Uh, and so, I mean, I, I'm, at any rate, Amelia Earhart, okay? Yes, of course. And never, okay, <laughs> never was like this with men, because this is the point. Okay, so Amelia Earhart has a, in fact, in fact, my next book, my next essay collection, I'm going to reproduce the page from Newsweek magazine, okay, 1963, okay, I wrote in a letter to the editor that was like their number <coughs> one letter, I, I'm 16 years old, okay, at that point, okay, and, 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 and what, what, what was it, oh, I know what it was, and they put a picture, picture of Amelia Earhart there, and it was Valentina Tereshkova, okay, had become the first woman in space, okay, and I, uh, and the Soviet Union had, had sent her up, and I wrote a protest letter into Newsweek, okay, and I said that Valentina Tereshkova has become, the, the cosmonaut, has become the first woman on the anniversary that Amelia Earhart flew the ocean, whatever, whatever it was, it was some big anniversary of her. And I said, I said, it, it obviously, you know, uh, Amelia Earhart's lifelong, you know, fight for the for equal opportunity for American women remains to be won. That's 1963. Okay, so Gloria Steinem, okay, can lick dirt, okay, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> you know, when, when I was doing that, Gloria Steinem was running around New York in a plastic skirt. I'm telling you, okay. Now oh. you, you she can is a fraud, that woman. You fraud. consume, <laughs> absorb. Yeah. experience a remarkable number and amount and diversity of cultural products music art architecture interior design yes fashion whatever right now just into a very prosaic question yes. in terms of your own time management how is it that you do what you do what is your method so to speak what is your diet 
Yeah, well, it's a lifestyle. I mean, a, a, of observation, you know. And, and I, I feel that the basis of my work is not not only the care I take with with writing, okay, with um, the my quality control of my, my prose, but also my observation. I, it's like twenty four seven. I'm always observing, and I, and I and I don't just like sit in a university. I don't go. To, I never go to conferences. That is a terrible mistake. Okay, and, and, oh, <laughs> a conference is just like overlaying the same kind of you know insular ideology, you know, on top of it. I I'm always like uh, listening to conversations at the shopping mall. Okay, the I, radio. I, I, I watch. I, I adore radio. I, the, the radio is fant fantastic. Uh, the sh any show on radio, the talk shows, uh, political talk shows, but also the sports shows. Okay, that is the uh, so sports <laughs> shows are the only place that you can hear on radio actual working class voices calling in. Okay, for you know, when I'm talk about what happened in, in, you know, in the game on Monday and, and what they would do if they had two million dollars and, and, and who they would hire and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's fantastic. Fantastic, and I, so my 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 writer's voice is actually very you know rather than the, these novelists okay with, you know with their recherche you know the, the lingo <laughs> and so on my my actual writing voice is very in, influenced by the way of, it's, uh, English is spoken today okay you know by people and often men okay on radio okay so you get this like high impact kind of a sound you, see? Now, you yeah. once wrote and I quote my substitute for LSD was Indian food. <laughs> And by I'm that, so you meant lamb vindaloo. Yes, yes. You stand I'm, I'm, by I've this. been in a rut on lamb vindaloo. It's, oh, it's, right. it's, it's a horrible rut. It's no, not it's a horrible, horrible rut. No, it's, it a, may it's, be a, a, it's rut. a 40-year rut. No, it's a 40. I, every time I go to an Indian restaurant, I said, "Now I'm going to try something new." But no, I must <laughs> go back to the lamb vindaloo. All I know is I do. It's like an ecstasy for, for me. The lamb vindaloo. So, like to Quincy, tell us what are the effects of lamb vindaloo? I, I don't. I can't. I don't. What can I say? I, I, I attain you know nirvana. On, on, uh, just, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh uh, no, yeah. Oh, yeah. How would you describe your views on astrology? A reader wrote to me, asked me to ask you. Wait, this. wait, you asked, you mentioned LSD. Can I say something else sure, about that? Sure, LSD, please. Right, okay. <laughs> now, LSD, okay, you know, it's I never took it. Thank God. I never I never took I never took drugs. I didn't believe I thought, what is this untested thing? I didn't believe I thought, you know, like a little wine, beer, you know, all these Man, things that like have hun you know, thousands of years behind them. Right. I said, well, you know, this LSD. So I'm I'm so glad I never took it. Uh, <laughs> everyone around me was taking LSD, okay? And um, and people who did take LSD and survived will still say things like, Well, I'm really Really glad I did, okay? Because I, you know, so and I, and it, everyone who says that, I, I feel actually never attained the level of accomplishment that they should have in terms of whatever their vision had been. I think LSD gave vision, okay? It gave vision, but then it deprived people of the ability to translate that vision, okay, into material form, you know, for the present and for and for posterity. But uh, but I, I still remain, you know, very um, oriented toward the LSD vision. I mean, I feel that I almost, I feel like I took LSD because of the music, the music, you know, like. like you know, with, with bathing at Baxter's, Jefferson Airplane, you know, with the, the, the first people to be using like this. Okay? And the <coughs> distortions of the birds, you know, eight miles high. I adore that, that song. Sure. And so on. I, you, I just feel I'm in that psychedelic world. So I, 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 I have sometimes said, that what I do is psychedelic criticism because it is metaphysical and it's visionary. Okay? I have a vision. I have a vision. Okay, that's that's bigger than the, the society. That's the problem with with the Marxist approach. I I believe the Marxist approach is useful. Okay, Ar, you know uh, Arnold Hauser is like one one of the great. Um, uh, you know, the social history of art is one of the most influential <laughs> things on me. It's a Marxist perspective, and indeed, my work is always very attentive to this, 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 so, the social context of anything, right? But, okay, it, what Marxism lacks is that larger vision of the universe. Okay, there are all kinds of uh, questions and uh, issues about human life that Marxism has no answers for. It doesn't even see it, okay? They don't, it doesn't see nature, okay? What kind of a vision, okay, it doesn't see nature, can only see society. So this is what's happening. We have all these graduates of the elite schools, okay, who have not, whereas, whereas, as, you know, my generation was all into you know cosmic consciousness and like opening. You know, we were influenced by by Hinduism and, and Buddhism and all kinds of Eastern. So that's I feel that is the true multiculturalism. I've been arguing for that for 25 years. I've been saying that if you want true multiculturalism, you have to present world cultures, okay, yeah. and, and the whole and, and including religion, okay. Religion is extremely important as as one the most complex systems that the human beings have ever devised were, were the the great religions of the world. Past Arnold Hauser, past Norman. Brown, yeah. who are the contemporary writers and thinkers who influence you now who are writing serious books on either the world cultures or anything else? Is there anyone left resonance? writing uh, serious books? I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to think who has written a serious book that I'm interested in right now. Um, I, 
There's, there's no one I would say, oh, so and so's book is coming. I'm, I, what, what, what? They're dead. You know, the, the, the people, the people who, who I admire are, long, you know, long dead. Um, and, and unfortunately, you know, I, I, it's a terrible destruction. I mean, I, my, my work looks very strange and idiosyncratic because I'm, I'm alone. Okay, I'm alone. And the, all my, the people who <coughs> should have been writing interesting, quirky books, okay, like as I do. Um, are are dead, okay? They're, or or their or their brains were destroyed in LSD, okay? They they and uh, it's, it's one or, one or the other, um, because I knew so many, you know, to me, brilliant minds in graduate school and then early early in my teaching career at Bennington College, really brilliant minds, and I I had I had great hopes for them. And for what they would do, and then some, and then they could, they couldn't get anything done. They couldn't, they, for whatever whatever reason. Okay, they they couldn't, um, they didn't have the I don't know what they didn't have the resilience to continue against obstacles. Like when when they would get re when their work would get rejected, they would they would become discouraged and would stop. Okay, and and rejection simply infuriates me. Okay, and so on. I say, well, I'll have my revenge on you. Okay, in the afterlife. Okay, and so on. <laughs> I'll be around and you'll be dead. I mean, so I mean, I don't, it's an Italian thing. What can I say? Okay, you know, we. we this is <laughs> Sexual Persona, your best known book, yeah. which I recommend to everyone if you haven't already read it. And Took read 20 years. All of it. My favorite chapter is the Edmund Spencer chapter. Really? By the way. Why? That How brought strange. Spencer to life for me. Oh, my I, goodness. I realized it was a wonderful book. And oh my I God. had no idea. I thought of it as old and fusty oh. and stuffy. Yes. And 100% because of you. Well, we should tell them that the Fairy Queen is like quite, quite forgotten now, but it had enormous impact. Okay, Spencer's Fairy Queen on on Shakespeare and on and on the Romantic poets and so on and so forth. And the Fairy Queen had been taught in this very moralistic way. But in my chapter, I showed that it was entirely a work of pornography. Okay, equal to the Marquis de Sade. Okay, so that's <laughs> what, and how interesting that you would be drawn to that. Very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so the cover image is Queen Nefertiti yes. in the Neues Museum in Berlin. And recently in the news, we've seen that yes. someone has scanned the bust. Oh, that's and it will awful. soon be possible using 3D printers to print out your own quote unquote unquote copy <laughs> of Nefertiti. <laughs> and how do you feel about this? Oh, well. Uh, well, you know, um, to me, you know, archaeology is one of, one of the, you know, my master tropes. What can, I, what can I say? And the, you know, the bust of Nefertiti discovered in 1912, I mean, it's amazing. It's, you know, barely, we've known it for like a century. It's, a, it's extraordinary, isn't it, how it's become uh, such a symbol of, of, of art. Um, and then, oh, and, I, and what you say that um, all the push, you know, of, um, of, uh, Countries like Greece and Egypt to recover their masterpieces from where they were taken, you know, and scattered around the world. I mean, I think uh, with what's been happening with, um, you know, ISIS and um, you know the demolition of Palmyra and all kinds of things that have happened. I, I, my attitude now is like, keep Nefertiti in Berlin, please. Okay, you know, don't don't send it back to Cairo. Of all the aesthetic judgments in your writings, and you've covered a lot of ground, but are there any where you really fundamentally regret? an earlier judgment and have revised it, hmm. not in a marginal way, which happens all the time, but really just thought, well, I, I was wrong about that. Hmm. Interesting. <laughs> I don't know. I, 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 I'm trying to think. Well, I mean, my early work, I, I, I worked on for so long that there was like, I had plenty of time for, you know, sort of second thoughts and third thoughts and hundred thoughts. So, um, no, I, I mean, I can't think of anything offhand. Can I get back to you about that? Sure, sure. <laughs> if you could travel to one place you haven't been, where would it be, and why? I, I, I I'm like um, Huisman's esthete in Des Sant. I, I am not a great fan of traveling. I just mm -hmm. feel it's like, you know, <laughs> it's become too onerous. Um, no, I, I, I'm a traveler. With a, I'm a mind traveler. Okay. What is your unrealized dream in life? My unrealized dream to meet Catherine Deneuve. But I met her once. I ran into her. Smack ran into her once on on, on Fifth Avenue in front of Saks. I know this is kind of bizarre. So it's a realized dream. It, it, yes, but it, it, yes, it was odd. But it was odd. Yes, I like I pursued her into the glove department and forced her to sign <laughs> my ticket envelope for the Fillmore East, where I was seeing the Jefferson Airplane. Um, <laughs> um, to have a conversation with Catherine Deneuve, shall we say, <laughs> civilized conversation. Now on that topic, one of your books. The Birds, yeah. about the Alfred Hitchcock movie, the great book, one of my favorite movies. Mm. Uh, 
Going back to that time, if you had the opportunity to date either Suzanne Plachette or Tippi Hedren. Date? To date? date? I don't date. I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just a n mad nun is all that right? I am. <laughs> of course. Date. I don't, I don't date. Dating is so banal. Okay, so, yeah. What? T. <laughs> with Suzanne Plachette or Tippi Hedren. Well, Tippi Hedren invited me to lunch in Rodeo Drive after, after that. I was, I was, I don't know, some, giving some speech on Shakespeare at the I think Los Angeles a, a Public Library. And so she invited to, to thank me for, for writing this. And, and I met her, she had a stack of 12 of these books, and I signed them. She was the most elegant and wonderful, warm woman. And I, I didn't have time, much time. She invited me to go to the ranch and see all the, the animals and the lions, you know, that she collected and so on. Um, but um, and, and Suzanne Plachette, I think, was absolutely un, un, you know, un, underutilized by Hollywood. What, what an intelligent, uh, just, just knife sharp character um, she was. In fact, I recently, in one of my salon columns, compared her to, uh, you know, Lena Dunham is, oh, Lena Dunham, oh God, okay. <laughs> Lena Dunham is a product of exactly the same world, okay, that, that whole affluent art entertainment world in Manhattan. I said, well, look what's happened to, to you know, to, to culture. If you want, to, you want to see the difference between Suzanne Plachette, okay, sophisticated Suzanne Plachette, all right, and Lena Dunham, okay, uh, you want to see what the decline, okay, that we're in the middle of right now. There it is. Oh, can, so I, can, I, can, can I say a word about this? Sure. Okay, all right. All right, so, okay, so I wrote this, so the British Film Institute asked me to write on a film, and I, I, I said, how about the birds, and I did, okay. So I wrote this, this book, okay, and, um, and it was universally, like, a you know, panned, okay, by the film journals, okay, which said about it, okay, uh, this book does nothing. This book does nothing, okay? And by which they meant that I didn't, it wasn't post-structuralist, it wasn't post-modernist, there wasn't a lot of theory, I wasn't citing, you know, the male gaze, et cetera, et cetera, right? All this book does is go through the film, The <coughs> Burns, okay, from beginning to end, scene by scene by scene, and pays attention to the film, okay, <laughs> itself, okay? And, so, and slowly it's made its way, and, and so, so now, it, oh, now, many, now here it is, it was 1998 when that came out, and I'm starting to get, it's starting to happen now, like the Rutledge, you know, Rutledge is like a publisher that's like nothing but this theory stuff. And so they're starting to go, hmm, okay, maybe there was something in with her. So I'm, I'm hoping, I'm just trying to inspire, you know, graduate students, okay, to rebel against this, this horrible, um, you know, the fascism that's, that forces theory onto them before they expose themselves into everything that's, that's wonderful, you know, and Im imaginative in the history of, of literature and art. And, and so, I, the, the, so the, the, I, I believe that paying minute attention to the actual work itself is the mission of criticism. And I am hopelessly old fashioned because that's not what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to, like, you're supposed to, you, you mentioned Foucault, you know, 59 times in one paragraph, <laughs> et cetera. Wait, what an, I win bag that guy is, I'm telling you. <laughs> Foucault is nothing. He's nothing, okay? Nothing, okay? And the reason why I know he's nothing is because. He was influenced by, you know, he, 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 he pretends to be such a mastermind, but in fact, he's just a collection of influences. And one of the biggest influences on him was Irving Goffman, okay, of, of Philadelphia, okay, who sure. was like the great sociologist, <laughs> uh, originally Canadian, okay, who wrote The Presentation of Self in Everyday Life. And so all, all the things that were influenced on me, okay, uh, you influenced Foucault. And so you have all these people thinking Foucault uh, was some sort of innovative figure in the history of, uh, you know, of, of modern uh, sociology or, 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 you know, or intellect, and he, and he wasn't. So it, it, it is a disease in, in, in these people. That, you know, everywhere, every single university in the United States, every single gender studies you know, d department, okay, see, they're impregnated with, with Foucault. And, it's what, and, 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 and that's, that's why you know, uh, you have, we have you know, graduates who, who know nothing. Impregnated is an interesting word to use. Yes, it is. <laughs> yes, yeah, it is. Do you like Marnie, the Hitchcock movie? Uh, like you, I mean, I like Marnie, uh, certainly. There are parts of, you know, I mean, I like most of Marnie, yeah, um, yeah. Um, but it goes askew in a way the birds doesn't. Yeah, so it, it, it's like, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's not, um, uh, yeah. I mean, there are, there are problems with it. I mean, that, that, so much was toxic going on on the set between um, Hitchcock and, and Tippi Hedren at that, at that point, you know, and so on. But, I mean, there are wonderful things in Marnie. So if you were to take someone who had read all or almost all of your work, and they had a sense of you and read a lot of your columns, you know, watch some of your talks on, online, whatever. And they had a picture of you, but you wanted to tell them one thing about you that maybe they wouldn't get from any of that, about what motivates you, what drives you, what your life is actually like. like 
What, what is my life is completely mundane. I'm a school marm. <laughs> okay, that's all I am. Okay, and, and I had the wisdom, hello, being, being having been raised Catholic. Okay, that once I became known, finally became known, at age 43, I didn't change one thing about my life. Not one thing. Okay, I didn't move to New York. I didn't go chasing around. I didn't get a like you know, uh, you know, a speakers bureau, all, all that stuff. I try to keep app like you know. My, I guess it's all the. I have a cousin who's a nun. Okay, and and I have all these you know, I'm just, just bishops and you know priests and sextons and so on in their family and so on, um, and, I, and I just try to keep to reality, okay, because I know that the basis of my work is my, the closeness that, you know, the, the, with which I live to ordinary life, okay, that, that's, a, you know, and so on. I mean, and, and, um, uh, and you know, I, I'm, and I, I hate the elites, I hate parties, okay, <laughs> I don't have book parties or anything like that, and so on, and so on. Um, you know, and, and, and people, I think that people, you know, they want success and, and they want material, you know, advantages and, the, and so on, and they don't. And it's really being a writer is just scut work, okay? And being a teacher, I mean, and see, and that's what Susan Sontag also did wrong, okay? Susan Sontag okay, began in graduate school, and then oh, it's so boring, okay, and so on. She did a little teaching, and then and then she went off and became a luminary, okay? And so so, so she was a big you know luminary, big giant dirigible luminary, whole <laughs> life like floating <laughs> above the continents. Here's Susan Sontag, the dirigible, woo, here she is, and so on. All right. So if, if nothing that she said it made any sense actually over time okay eventually okay and and she and she loved to she loved to hold court at parties as notorious and so pe people who remember her so brilliant, she was so brilliant why well, I saw her at this dinner party everyone was in awe okay well people who tried to go to dinner parties to impress other people it is such BS okay and so Susan Sontag over time her work got less and less meaningful like, even though people worship at the shrine you know of Sontag you, know, you try to quote her on anything what can you quote her on okay you know there's nothing you can quote her. I mean the, 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 the one thing you can quote her on yeah, is the thing that she regret no, no, the, quote, quote a sentence from Susan Sontag, a great sentence. You, you can't. The only sentence is, was the one she regretted. The white race is the cancer of history. Okay? That's the one she retracted finally when she got cancer. Maybe that she, that she, she realized how horrible that was. She thought that was so horrible. Now she realized. And now I realize I shouldn't have said that. Okay? And so on. Okay? That's the only thing that you can quote her on. She, you, she's not quotable okay? because, because there's all this sleight of hand that she's doing. She's taking material that she borrows from others you know, or, or places that she's been personally at a time when, when downtown New York was very exciting. So it basically was a kind of transcription of her, of her everyday life. I think what the best thing she did probably was, um, for me, like she wrote a very witty thing, The Imagination of Disaster. I, I like that essay a lot, which is all about the horror films of the 1950s. And I thought, if she only had stayed like that, okay, it was kind of unpretentious and um, really engaging with actual materials, okay, and so on. Um, but uh, Susan, Susan Sontag, um, basically her life became um, going from lecture to lecture, being you know, being hailed as the as the great one, and and being so detached, okay, from from ordinary life. Whereas when you're a teacher, like a classroom teacher. Um, you know, as as I've been now for, you know, for forty years, I mean, there's not there's you know the, the, the kids don't care. I mean, the kids have no idea that I write books. I mean, so and they'll, they'll hear now and then someone they'll hear someone's father will say, you know, she oh, I, you know, she writes books, okay, and they'll come and say, oh, yeah, my father is like a fan of yours, and so on, and so on. So I say, oh, it, uh, really? Oh, that's so nice, okay, and so on. All right, I, I, I'll say, but I, you know, I don't want to do it. So the point is, all these professors at Harvard and Princeton and Yale, they're like, you know, they they have, they have the graduate students are paying court to them because they, they need letters of recommendation, hello, and you know, they they want something from you, and so on. All right, so they're so used, they're so grand, and so on. I am, you know, I I, I go in and it's like, you know. The, the, we need there more chairs, okay? What, what's wrong? The, the, you know, the curtain is right, and so on. I'm always in touch with the janitors and, and so on and so forth. Infrastructure, condition of the buildings. I deal with everyday life, okay? All right? And, and, and there's no, and I, I'm not treated like a, a queen. I'm just like an ordinary, you know, school mom working, you know, in the, you know like, a, like a horse and so on, uh, pulling the plow, et cetera. So I think that's really good. I think that's a really good idea for, for writers or for, you know, is, is to have a job where you're dealing with constant frustrations and problems and you know and, and so on. I think that's really good like for you. Like Herman Melville, right? Yes. Hunting yes, whales yeah, is or, not easy. Or Wallace Stevens, you know, yeah. he like kept going to the office, you know, the insurance company and so on. You know, I mean, every day. Okay. So my last question before they get to ask you, but I know there are many people in this audience, or at least some, who are considering some kind of life or career in the world of ideas. Mm. And if you were to offer them a piece of advice mm -hmm. based on your years struggling with the infrastructure mm. and the number of chairs mm -hmm. and whatever else, yeah. 
What would that be? Get, have, get a job. Get, get, get a, have a job. Okay, that's the real job. Okay, where you 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 and, and every time you have frustrations <laughs> with the real job, you say this is good. Okay, this is good. Okay, they, 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 because this is reality. This is the reality as everybody lives it. Okay, um, and this thing of like withdrawing from the world to be to be a writer, I think is is a terrible mistake. Also, just be, I, I, I mean, I, number one thing is constantly observing. I mean, my whole life, I've, I'm, I'm constantly jotting things down, like, uh, constantly. Okay, just jot, 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 jot. I'll have an idea. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm cooking, okay, and I have an idea. Okay, whoa, 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 what, and so, have to, and so I have like a lot of pieces of paper with like tomato sauce, you know, on them or, <laughs> or, or, or whatever. And I, and I transfer these to cards or I transfer them to, to notes, et cetera. So um, I'm just constantly open, okay, um, and everything is on all the time, you know, like that, what on. And, and, I, and, <laughs> and I never say this is important, this is not important, okay. And, so that's, and that's why I got into popular culture at a time when, when popular culture was, was very, in fact, I, I, there's, no, there's absolutely no doubt that Yale graduate school that I, I um, lost a great huge credibility with the professors because of my en endorsement of not only film okay but uh, and pop, but Hollywood okay when Hollywood Hollywood was considered crass entertainment and so on um, and that and that and now you know the media studies came in you know very strongly you know after that although highly theoretical not the way I, I, I teach me media studies but um, I, I also believe in following your own instincts and intuition okay all right that, 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 like, like there's something meaningful here you don't know what it is okay but you just keep you just keep it kind of on the back burner, okay? So that's, so that's basically how how I work is like um, is this the constant observation? There's nothing, and also I like I, I try to tell my students. I mean, they don't they never get the message really, okay? But but I'll, I always I tr what I try to say to them is that nothing is boring. That's nothing. Nothing is boring, okay? All right. If you're bored. You're boring, okay? All right, so I'm okay. <laughs> so on and so on. All right, and that and, and wherever you are is like you know it, it's exhausting. It's it's like frustrating. Uh, I don't know why. It's like I don't know the the plane has been canceled and whatever. So you know no. The, it, all right, the, after you get over your fury, okay, um, you realize okay what opportunity is there here to 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 absorb something more, okay, from this experience from, from observing other people or whatever it is, okay. And I I think there's really no experience that you can have that there's not something in there, okay, that eventually you can't. You know, use as part of a part of your developing system. So if it's, it's some, someone who, oh, another thing I have to say, anyone interested in ideas, do not read any of the the you know the the current books that are considered being like Pierre Bourdieu and all that stuff. Oh my God, it's like so, so completely something boring. Okay, I believe in the library. I, I, the library is my shrine. Okay, it was my shrine uh, when I was researching Amelia Earhart. When I got to Yale, Sterling Library was my shrine, um, and I just I ransacked uh, that that building. Okay, oh my God. And and, and that's the thing is that I've learned more from from the old and ant, old commentators, Sir James George Fraser, the Golden Bough, which was considered completely you know gone, but had a huge impact on the wasteland and other other things, other big works of modernism. But I've learned a great deal from from uh, you know the the, um, the commentators of the past, the, the historians of, of, of the past. Now when I did the, when I did um, where is uh, glittering images, okay. Uh, the, the actual, you know, nullity of current scholarship became very exposed to me. I, of course, I already knew about it, but but I, but I really saw, I really got, um, you know, uh, objective proof of it. But I've got each artwork that I chose, or like there's a 29 chap chapters in it. Um, each artwork that I chose, I did a full research of what had been said about that particular artwork. Okay, and so I began chronologically. I would work if it was like an older work from the late 19th century, moving through the decades, you know, to, to the present. Okay, and so for each of those art, so there you. Real, oh my God! Could you see it? Could you see the fall in the quality of you know of scholarship? Okay, in our time, in the, from the 1980s on. Okay, I would I would move from these incredibly erudite and, and, and wonderful sentences and, and and just you know beautiful stylists about about art, about art. So late 19th century, moving into the, into the 20th century, and still still solid into about the 60s, okay? And then all, and then the 70s is kind of a, a holding year. And then all of a sudden comes the 80s, 90s, 20s. And all these people are pygmies, pygmies, the people at, at, at the elite schools. And you know, you know, you know oh, you know, let me say, there, there's no, you know, you know the, the big art survey courses, you know, are, you know, are, are being dismantled. Hello, okay. It used to be, you'd have a two semester course. It would begin with, with cave art and then move in two semesters down to modernism, okay? 
magnificent structure, uh, now abandoned, you know, wholesale, except when, when students have protested, like at Smith. Um, it, it, my, my sister is a graduate of Smith and, and was part of the protest that they got, they got the survey restored. All right, but people no longer, the, gra, gra, graduate students in art history and art historians no longer have the ability, okay, to teach the big picture because all narratives are regarded as fictional now, imperialistic fictions, okay? So the entire story of art is not possible and therefore people know nothing. I need to give them the chance to ask you questions, but thank you for a fascinating discussion. We have two mics. I will alternate mics. We start here. Feel free to identify yourself if you would like. Hi, my name is Shana Davidson. Oh, hello. Um, you mentioned Smith. I saw you speak at Smith <gasps> or Mount Holyoke in 1993. Oh, okay. Um, and it was fascinating to compare that to this because there was a great deal of booing and hissing mm -hmm. at Smith. Yes. But it was um, eye opening to me, um, you know, being kind of steeped in this. I am going to wrap up. Being steeped in this, um, you know, the hegemony of the patriarchy and, and how we must even dress like men, and you saying uh, something to the effect of, I teach in a skirt because I have more control of the, over the classroom that way. Oh, I, I, don't, I, don't, I actually don't, I don't remember teaching in a skirt, but go ahead. Okay, I, I, but I, in I any case, I, oh, I remember question. something to that effect. Yeah, okay, the yeah. question is, yeah. do you think that feminism has evolved beyond that, or is it just sort of running that same record dry? Well, it, it was at Smith. It, 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 it's, I mean, it's really shocking. Um, yeah, when I arrived at Smith, it, they, had, they had papered the the walkway. In fact, okay, as people walked in with like all these like and think, you know all these hostile and un uncomprehending things, people had no idea what my real ideas were. They just it was just part of this. It was <coughs> the the, P, the whole PC thing was um, escalating out of control at that point. But it's really it's really shocking. I mean, here here's a you know a, a, a person, a, a woman, a middle aged woman at that point. I'm in my forties who had um, spent 20 years writing a book that, you know, that had been rejected and finally was published by Yale Press, a book on the whole history of, of, of the Western civilization. And this is the treatment that I got, okay, at Smith College from one, one of, this is one of the bastions of the Ivy League, or, 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 not, or not of the Ivy League, but of the Seven Sisters. Um, you know, one of the most noble names in the history of modern women's education. I mean, isn't that, it shows you, okay, how ideology really is very dis distorting. But, you know, if, well, feminism, you know, it's like, um, as, is, is going through phases. I mean, I, I call myself a feminist, absolutely. I, I simply belong to a dissident wing of feminism. And I think that, the, that the, the error made by all these people was not to understand that my wing of feminism had been suppressed and silenced at that point for 25 years. And eventually, we, uh, we won in the 90s, the pro-sex wing of feminism, thanks to Madonna, who wasn't a feminist, okay, but, but because of Madonna's um, you know, foregrounding of, of sexual themes and so on, okay, it, it, allowed, it allowed us to break through the over-control by the Steinem Politburo. Okay, I'll take time. another question, but you'll still get to say more. Okay, um, but the, um, the, 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 <laughs> prob the problem is, okay, that the problem is right now, okay, that a whole ge younger generation has risen up and it's now Steinem has returned, okay, she's like a, like a bad penny, okay, she's, she's, back, she's back again. Uh, so, we're, so we have to, we're, so we, I mean, I feel like oh, I'm back to square one, okay. Next question, here. Oh, I'm sorry we can't, can't go on, but. <laughs> All right, thanks yes. for coming. Uh, so you, you mentioned your incident with uh, Catherine Deneuve, and you also talked about that in 1995 in Playboy, you know, following her, and also having 599 pictures of uh, Elizabeth Taylor. <laughs> so, but then at the same time earlier this year, you, when David Bowie passed away, and you mentioned how he had reached out to you and wanted to meet you, you talked about how you weren't sure you would have wanted to because you have to keep a respectful distance from an artist of that towering yeah. stature. Yeah. So, you know, you also mentioned in that interview that Obsession and genius are pretty much the same thing. So where would you draw the line between, you know, say you have an opportunity to meet someone who, who is very important to you or contrive a meeting or just seek them out. Where do you draw the line between the obsession, and I mean the, the, the Polly kind of obsession, not the Roy Hinckley kind, <laughs> and um, just that respectful distance. I mean, do you stifle creativity with respect for, you know, who this person is and their privacy? Well, I, I, I think I've, I personally have never had this great desire necessarily to meet you know, the um, figures that I most admire in the arts. 
um, because I understand that w what they represent on screen is something that is a, you know, it's a, an artificial construction. It's not, it's not the reality that, that um, in, I've been working in art schools also my entire career. So I, I, I know, I have dancers in my class, I have actors in my class, and I, I completely understand the difference between, between the, um, the fallible, you know, real self, the mundane real self, okay, and, and, the, and the artistic self suddenly emerges within what I, what I call, the, you know, the, the temenos, okay, which, which is the, you know, the, the, the sacred precinct that I regard as, as, as art, okay. And therefore, uh, when I encountered Catherine Deneuve by accident that day, and, you know, I, and I was at the peak of my obsession with her, it, it really ru almost ruined my um, interest in her, okay, because it's like, oh my God, it's like, you know, I did, it, it's not the real Catherine Deneuve, <laughs> that, that, you know, that I was so in, intent uh, on. It was, it was this magical creation that, that is a result of her talent, but also of, of you know, of the director's uh, own magical skills and, and so on. Yeah, Kat, uh, oh yes, Elizabeth Taylor, I get 599 pictures, yes. People, people often say what's odd about that is, is not the number, but that I had counted them, okay, <laughs> so, all right. <laughs> But uh, yes, she, oh, she represented to me everything, the, 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 the pure sexuality that, was, that had been re repressed okay, during the, during the you know, Doris Day 1950s um, uh, and, and early 60s. Butterfield Day still remains for me like a great pagan you know, um, uh, exhibition. Okay, where, where here is uh, Elizabeth Taylor is a high-class high call girl. Oh my God. And, 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 and I, I had Jean Moreau you know, and, uh, and Monica Vitti and, uh, you know, and Nuka May and there were so many, and Melita Mercury, there were so many phenomenal images that, that I, I was inundated with when I was in, in high school and college, and what and, and what do these kids have today? You know, Taylor Swift. Oh my God. Okay, it, this, I mean, it's just, she is oh, she is such a fake. I mean, she like she poses and things that she she imagines are sexy and sultry, and it's like so fake, awful, awful, awful. Okay, but but at least Rihanna, who's like you know on dope most of the time, and that's why she looks so sultry. Okay, but you know, <laughs> R uh, uh, Rihanna's Instagrams are to me like a work of art. That's why that's all the only thing I'm following right now. I have to say that's of, of, of equal in importance is, is Rihanna. You know, flow from what from one one nightclub to another okay and, and yet yes some other fashionable thing all right but back to your question um, yeah, no, wait, 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 wait did I answer I, I don't know if I answered I'm not the question. sure either. Okay. I'm not sure <laughs> <laughs> Oh, David Bowie. David Bowie. Okay. All right. Now, Bo Bowie. You know, I wrote this. Uh, you know, this. I wrote this um, uh, essay called, you know, called "Theater of Gender." Uh, David Bowie at the climax of the sexual revolution. I wrote it for the <laughs> Victorian Albert um, I I the exhibition catalog for the costume show that they did. And it's now still t just touring the world. And I consider it one of my most important pieces. Um, uh, but uh, it's uh, it's in the catalog. I, I, I want to get into my next uh, essay collection. But with Bowie, I mean, but, but see, Bowie is like different than Deneuve. I mean, but Bowie is true. Truly, uh, like a like a creative artist. I mean, whereas Deneuve and Taylor are you know performers in, in other people's fictions, but 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 Bowie was was truly a you know a, a master creator of, of of a level that just it's it's staggering. When I when I when I did the research for the um, for that essay, I just was I knocked out all you know uh, over again. Okay, at the, at the enormity of, of what he what he achieved, and also at how little uh, has been acknowledged his deep knowledge of the visual arts and, what, and how he had been influenced by. That I like. I, I found all kinds of little details, you know, that, that showed his deep knowledge, his erudition, you know, about that. And, and, and it appears to be that he did, did t tell the, the VNA to um, to invite. Yeah. So that that time, uh, what, what the, the people don't know what you're talking about is where um, it was like early in the in the 1990s, and a message came to my publisher, to the public, saying. Um, it, it, and it was conveyed to me by the, by the publicist and my publisher, is saying, um, David Bowie wants your phone number. And I, I burst out laughing. I said, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I said, that's ridiculous. I said, oh, oh boy, it's just some fan trying to get it. I said, so on. And they said, oh, David Bowie, the, the claim really wants your phone number. I said, oh, is, that, is that the way David Bowie gets in touch with you when he wants your phone number? No. So I laughed and all that. And, so and I didn't believe it. And, and it was all so shadowy. I mean, it's like, in, in, in only, only now, only when I, actually, after I did the research for this um, Victorian Albert thing, Thing, did I realize that the reason it was so strange was that he had fired his entire staff, he had fired his <coughs> management, he, was fi he had fired his company, you know, a a dealing with the record companies and so on after Berlin, okay, and that he only dealt with the world via friends, okay, and, that, and that, so that's what was so strange about it. It was strange, okay, and I, so I, I, made, a, I made a mistake, okay, and, he, it, and he, what he wanted was he wanted to use an excerpt from Sexual Persona in, on a record album in, in, in one of his lyrics. I thought, oh my God, all right, so, all right, so it's very embarrassing that that, that happened, but, um, um, you know, but, uh, but that's okay. I mean, I, I really don't. I, I, I don't. I, I think there should be a distance, okay, to, to, with, with great art, a sense of respect and reserve with great artists. Next question. 
Hi, um, so I'm Kelly Ferguson. Oh, I'm hi. A, hi, I'm a master's economics student here oh. at George Mason. <laughs> okay. And I'm told today is equal pay day, so that makes the question I want to ask you about pay disparity even more relevant, I guess. I've um, been thinking about it a lot, and it seems to me that it boils down to a problem of culture to the extent that, for example, Mark Zuckerberg publicizing taking paternity leave does more to alleviate the pay disparity problem that we have than either companies or governments setting a policy because to the extent that the, the demand for flexibility to have children and care for children <laughs> is only used by women, it's going to hurt us on the margin when it comes to pay. And since you're such a great and incisive social critic, I just wanted to get your thoughts on that. Well, I mean, I, I, first of all, um, you know, the, the, I think you know what um, the, you know the, the way that my own party, the Democratic Party, is using this rubric of you know of equal pay for women as if you know, th this has not been a matter of law ever since the you know the presidency of JFK, for heaven's sakes. I mean, they, you know, with, with, um, there there are there may be cases you know of outrageous uh, uh, disparity in pay for uh, doing the same work. I mean, n now and then they'll find something like in a, a, a hospital, you know. A, a woman doctor, uh, a veteran doctor, has, was not being paid at the same level. But it's like rare, okay, when these ac actual cases um, do surface. Okay, what, what, uh, what? Uh, there's a, all this propaganda being, being being pumped out, okay, about this issue. When in fact, uh, if women are not, if women are earning 72 cents or 75 cents on the on, on the dollar, okay, it's not that it's not, uh, but for the same job, okay, that's this is the lie that's being told. All right, I mean, women are not being doing the same job as a man are not being paid 75 cents for, for something that the man is being paid a dollar. What it is is, is overall the averages of, um, of women ch of their own volition for whatever reasons are taking jobs okay, that have more flexibility okay, um, a, as opposed to the around the clock, seven days a week, night, night thing okay, that maybe high. For example, women tend to shy away from, sale, from commission sales, sales jobs okay, where they're on, on the road a lot. Okay, um, and that's where a lot of men you know, have very, very high <laughs> earnings. Okay, they, and w women, you know, have uh, for, for are making choices. They would prefer to be closer to their children. Okay? So yes, there is th these disparities um, are ultimately based in biological differences. Okay? So now, you know, Susan Faludi and these other, um, you know, the, the, f the feminists of, of uh, the Steinem kind of, uh, you know, um, credo. Uh, they have one answer, okay? Men must do more, okay? That's that's their answer. Men must do more. And I mean, Susan Faludi has never had a child, okay? So has absolutely no idea, all right? Um, and uh, you know, and I, um, you know, what I what I feel is that um, is that there is a tie. There is a, a there is an uh, you know um, what can I say? Ineffable, okay? Uh, uh, indefinable biological. Tie, okay, between a, between a, a child and uh, and the mother in whose body, okay, the child has developed into a, a full being, okay, and that there are all kinds of, of of impulses and instincts that women may have, okay, of protectiveness toward their biologically born children, okay, that that I think that it, I think it um, to to politicize the thing and to as, to assume that um, that a, that a woman bearing a child is like an automaton, okay, and yes, yes, here is the baby. Okay, here to, to my husband. It, you know, you, know, you, you are equally uh, equally fit. Okay, to be able to nurture this this month month old three month old child. Now, as as the chi as a child gets a little older um, and turns into a real human being. Okay, and with, with a personality and so on, it's not so dependent. Then is when men okay can do more. Okay, but I still I believe okay uh, personally from my observation of, of human life. Okay, that there is uh, there is something going on. The child, uh, an infant, doesn't want the father hello okay the infant wants the mother you want the nice cushy the smell is the mother okay who is this person coming closer that is them get, get, go away <laughs> it was like I mean when Freud talked about that it's like this, this, this distraction comes in the father get out okay remember this is why, why this is why Freud said every child wants to you know wants to kill the father and marry the mother okay etc et oh, you know, all right, all right. They, they, they don't know what men and, and men don't know what to do men are clumsy I and mean, they have like the big hands and and, 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 so, and so on okay and what I have seen from my um, observation is that women, I, and this is because um, my I, I have a you know I have a child who I'm adoptive you know, from my former partner and so on. Um, what I have seen is the world of the moms. Okay, I have seen the world of the moms from the inside. Okay, and um, and what I see is that is that um, the minute there are children in the, the, the children are born, 
the woman, it's the woman who biologically, I believe, has the master strategist mind, okay? She is the generalissimo of the household. The man, her husband, who was once her equal, shrinks down to merely one counter, okay? <laughs> All right? Becomes one. It is she who issues the master plan for the week. He is hopeless, okay? All right? She has, you know, has the multiple levels. She assigns, she knows what, and she's the one who talks, makes the schedule and so on. And, and the good father is the one who says, okay, yes, I will do. Okay, get, give me the plan. Give me the sheet and so on. But to ask men to do more, okay, seems to me to ask them to do something that they are not biologically prepared to do. Our next Thank question you. is oh, from a sorry, man. that was so interesting. I wanted to go on, but it's all right. Okay. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. <laughs> um, I'd just like to preface my question by saying that as a whirlwind, Job's God has nothing on you. Oh. <laughs> How nice. Thank you. <laughs> my question is, do you ever have any concern that modern literature and eventually all the classics will have to be rewritten so that in order to be understood, every fifth word will have to be the word like. <laughs> <laughs> Well, unfortunately, you know, the, the sense of language in general or, or you know, just uh, respect for language or interest in language is, is degenerating. I mean, I'm, I, I'm someone who used to, I used to write down, I mean, always, like, write down any word I, I, I don't know, you know, I, 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 and what I'm reading. I would make lists and I would, like, study the dictionary and etymologies, you know. And now um, young people, you know, have no concern for language per se. The way, the way they communicate with each other uh, in the email form and now in text, okay, is very truncated. Um, and so, uh, and, that, and that's it's why the writing on the web has also degenerated horribly. You know, the writing for blogs is blah, 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 blah. No one has, it, it used to be with newspapers and magazines, there was a space limit, okay? And that imposed a real, a real um, you know, a, a, a kind of, you know, format. It for, forced you to condense. And it, made, and it gave a kind of crispness to language. So we're in a period now, where I'm afraid that, that, uh, peop, that the ear for language is degenerating. One last yeah. question, very oh. quickly. Oh, the last one? Oh, no. All right, I'll try to be quick. Um, in my view, feminists have made a lot of progress in the Western world in the last century. And I'm curious to know if you think um, we're close to basically achieving the goals that were set out, um, or, if, or if the feminists will ever feel like the fact that more women go to college these days, for example, is, a, is a, a, like a symbol of progress, or that they'll never feel like there's, that sort of the job has been done. You have one minute, 30 seconds oh, no. to answer well, this I, question. Well, I'm an equal opportunity feminist, by which I believe that you know, all obstacles to women's advance in the political you know, and, you know, and, and professional realms you know, should be removed. But what I'm, I'm also saying is that there are huge areas of human life okay, that are not political, that have to do with our, our private spiritual natures. Okay? And, that, and that is a place where legislation will always be uh, hope, you know, helpless and hopeless and indeed intrusive. So I think that, that, you know, I think that um, feminism has made enormous gains. I mean, I, I, you know, I, uh, in terms of, um, uh, you know, uh, there was a time that um, women were totally dependent on, on father, on husbands, on brother, okay, for their for their survival. Now women can be self-supporting, can live totally on their own, and it's part part of this, you know, this whole whole Western world, uh, you know, uh, powered by capitalism, that uh, you know that our our university curricula are now habitually always in, in demeaning, right? Uh, I mean, capitalism made women's emancipation uh, possible. Possible. So uh, I think that the problem right now is that um, is that young young women have been taught uh, uh, that to to somehow to um, identify their own sense of personal unhappiness with men. And men are responsible for for my, uh, our unhappiness. When in fact, uh, part of the issue is that you know we have lived as a species you know for ten, for like tens of thousands of years, okay, where um, where mating occurred early was early, okay, where where you left your Parents' house, and you know, and, became, and had your own household, and your own your own children. Your own, and, and, and I mean, Juliet in Romeo and Juliet is 13, going on 14. Okay, you really already she's ready for, ready for marriage. So in this, like, we have a very long, a naturally long period here, you know, before women can attain some sense of of who they are as women. Okay, so I think I think that that's that is the, and it's not men, it's not the patriarchy. Okay, and it's ultimately not a feminist issue. It has something to do with the um, this very mechanical system. Of the, of the modern technological professional world that has emerged to replace the agrarian period, okay, when there were multi, multi generations living with each other, and there were, and there were, and and uh, and, the, and women had a natural sense of solidarity, okay, do, uh, being all together. There was the world of women and the world of men, 
Okay, once. Okay, we, they didn't have much, much to do with each other once. Okay, you know, it's, all the problems have happened since we started having to do with each other. <laughs> Just to close, Steven Pinker will be coming in October 24th. This summer we'll have Cass Sunstein, not yet scheduled. Uh, Camille, we thank you oh, thank heartily. You. Thank you. So, so thank much. You. Thank you.